بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال جل وعلا في القرآن المجيد والفقان الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما الحياة الدنيا إلا له ولعب وقال تعالى في مقام آخر إن هي إلا حياتنا الدنيا نموت ونحيا وما نحن ببعثين رب شرحني صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقو قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزدنا علما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلم وتسليما اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك وعلى ما سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين My respected brothers, friends, elders and distinguished sisters First and foremost we thank Almighty Allah Taala for his many gifts The greatest of which is Iman, the true belief in Allah Taala. And after that, the, the gift of life. Allah has given us life through which we can worship Him, recognize Him, and obey Him, believe in Him. In this day and age, we see how life is being taken as cheap, as worthless, depending on when, where a person is born, what religion a person follows, etc. But Allah Taala has showed us the way and Allah has told us the importance of life. In the Quran Allah says, Isn't he Allah insani he no dahni lam yakun shay madkura? Was it not a time that we didn't exist and then Allah brought us into existence? So Allah is saying, Thank me for even allowing you to exist. We see now it's been almost two months since the catastrophe, since the genocide which has been taking place and the oppression against the Muslims, our brothers, sisters children and elders in Gaza and in the West Bank as well and we see how the entire world is ganging up against one small town you could say and Allah Taala is going to show the truth it will come out victory will always be for the Muslims at the end of the day individually and as a nation but at this time it's very important for us to reflect on the reality of death because we constantly be seeing death on the news, when we open our feed, we'll see death. We'll see a, maybe an elder dying, a child dying, somebody addressing dead bodies, praying a janaza, holding a shroud. We're seeing death and almost we're becoming desensitized and we're not taking the, the actual purpose why Allah has created death and for us to see that what Allah wants for us to take. So it's very important for us to introspect now and always, but especially now, at what exactly is death? Is it something for us to fear? Is it for something for us to embrace? How should we approach it? Allah in the Quran says, Kullu nafsin Three times in the Quran, Allah says this is very important. Every single soul shall taste death. And dha'iqa actually means taste. It's not just a saying in English. Allah uses the same words in Arabic for us to understand that this is something we're going to taste. Whether sweet, whether bitter. Because tastes come of different flavors. Whether sweet, whether bitter, we are going to, we are going to taste it. And it's going to come to us. When describing this world, Allah says, مَا هَذِي الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَهُ وَلَعِبُ This world is only lahu and la'ib. Futile, play, enjoyment, merriment. وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ And the world of the hereafter, لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ Hayawan doesn't mean animal. It means hayawan from the word hay, hayat. Something which is going to continue forever, life, eternal life. That's the hereafter. That's this life compared to the hereafter. And our beloved Prophet ﷺ many times, has given different examples of this world compared to the hereafter. I've mentioned a few before the time when he, he said a person dips their finger in the ocean, the amount of water that residue of water that they have on their finger compared to the ocean is this world compared to the hereafter. Another time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave example or actually he was walking with companions and there was a dead carcass of an animal which was actually disabled. So it was disabled and dead. And the Prophet said, would anyone want to buy this? And the companion said, who would want to buy this? And the Prophet said, the, the world in the eyes of Allah is even worthless, more worthless than this. Another time the Prophet said that um, If this world in the eyes of Allah 
was to equate to even a janaha ba'udah, the wing of a mosquito, then Allah wouldn't allow one disbeliever to drink a sip of water. But it means nothing to Allah. That's why He gives it to those who believe in Him and those who dis disbelieve in Him. Those who obey and those who don't obey Him. So that's this world, we have to understand the reality. And that it's going to come to an end. Nobody can deny death, no matter how much people have tried. In the Quran, Allah says that قُلْ إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ مِنْهُ فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ That same death which you are trying to run away from, whether physically, whether mentally. Mentally meaning you just don't want to think about it. You know it's coming. Even the person on their deathbed is trying not to think that I'm going to die. And the person walking around is doing the same thing. The person in old age is doing the same thing. The person young is doing the same thing. But Allah is saying that, and then obviously physically, where people try to take medication or try to do surgery or try to do something just to prolong, prolong. Or even they make the house earthquake proof, hurricane proof, everything proof, so that I want to escape death. That's the end goal. But Allah says, قُلْ إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ مِنْ That death which you are trying to run away from, فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ It will reach you. فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ ثُمَّ تُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ عَالِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ then Allah will be able to ask you what you did in this world. But what, what exactly do we, un, do we picture death as? The, the Arabs have a saying, they say, الْمَوْتُ جِسْرٌ يُوصِلُ الْحَبِيبِ إِلَى الْحَبِيبِ يُوصِلُ الْحَبِيبِ إِلَى الْحَبِيبِ That death is just a bridge which takes the beloved and meets him towards his beloved, gets him to meet his beloved. Your beloved is on the other side, somebody you love, your family member, wife, husband, and there's nothing that can get you on the other side, it's water. And then somebody makes a bridge for you or says, I'll take you on a boat. How much will you appreciate that person? And the Arabs say, this is what death is. So we should actually appreciate it. And say, okay, this is how I'm going to meet my creator. The person who I've tried, wanted to please all my life. So this is death. So we should always ponder over death, especially at this time. Why? Because if we believe death is the end, then neither are we going to believe that those who are doing wrong are going to be held accountable. Because they're going to die and that's it. Most likely those who did wrong because they took advantage of others are living a good life. And if we don't believe that death is going to come, then we believe they're going to die and that's it. Number one. So then we believe those who should be held accountable are not going to be. The second thing we're going to end up believing is those who were wronged in this world are never going to get their justice. Those who were wronged in this world, where be it in Palestine, be it in Syria, be it in Iraq, be it anywhere, be it any faith as well, be it those who were killed in the Holocaust, be it anywhere, we believe they won't get their justice. So that's why it's very important that we reflect over death. And we ponder over it and we understand it's going to come. That's why our beloved Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith that um, I used to prohibit you from visiting graves. And then he said, Zuruha fa innaha al -akhirah. Visit the graves because it will remind you of the hereafter. Visit the graves because it will remind you of the hereafter. And then in another longer narration, he said, Shroud and bathe your dead. This will even give you an even more vivid image of what's going to happen after we die. So it's very important that we ponder over death, think about it. Under how do we do this? First of all, what are the benefits of thinking about death? Number one, it, te it teaches us to restrain our hopes. We won't start having long, lofty ambitions. Thinking that when I do this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this first. Then in a few years, I'm going to get a promotion. Or if I've got one business, then I'm going to expand. Then after 10 years this, after 20 years this, after 45 years this, then I'm going to move to this country. You know, long ambitions. And you don't know if you're going to see the next day. And that's the reality. So that's why it will, it will restrain our ambitions. Tulul Amal, the Prophet ﷺ said, is one of the things I fear upon my nation, my ummah, is that they have long ambitions, lofty ambitions. They think far ahead. Not in terms of religion, not in terms of I want to study for 10 years, etc. I want to do this much, I'll give this much charity. No, in terms of this world. So that's one thing that the Prophet feared upon. So the first thing when we ponder over death, and internalize that we're going to die one day and any time we're going to die, that we're not going to think too far ahead. The second thing, we'll start preparing for death. It's very important for death and what comes after. Because the journey only starts when we die. The Prophet ﷺ, he said on many occasions that when a person dies, there's, there's two types of people when they die. Mustarihun or mustarahun min. He said there's only two types of people, mustarih or mustarahun min. And then the companions asked, what does this mean? He said mustarih means a person who's relaxed. Meaning when, he's when he dies, he or she dies, passes away, they relaxed, everyone else is crying. Meaning they've gone from this world, they're happy, they've achieved what they wanted to achieve, they meet Allah Taala happy, everyone in this world is sad they're departing because they were a good person. They left good memories, left good uh, image of themselves. That's why one of the companions, Shaddad bin Aus, when a person passed away, the people were 
lamenting over the person passing. He said, why are you sad over the person passing? He is gone. And he has gone past three challenges which you lot are still yet to face. One is, what's going to happen when I die? So you don't know how you're going to die. Two, you don't know what's going to happen when the angel questions you in the grave. And three, you, know, you don't know what's going to happen when you meet Allah. He has gone past them challenges. So he doesn't have to worry. Start worrying about yourself. This is what he said. And once Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, somebody's janazah was going past. So the, somebody had passed away and they were calling the body. And then somebody just in the crowd just asked, whose janazah is this? And Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, just to quiet him and to make him understand or ponder over who it is, he said, it's yours. What did he mean by this? That it could be yours. You could be the one going. So think about yourself. Don't, don't ask these kind of questions like who's Janaza or where they're going, where they're going to bury. No, no, think about yourself. That's why Umar radiallahu anhu has a famous quote. He says, every day we hear Mata Fulan, especially in COVID and now with so much death happening and we have a whole list of children's names, etc. who've passed away. Umar radiallahu anhu said, every day we hear Mata Fulan. Somebody's passed away. So and so has passed. So and so has passed. So one day we're definitely going to hear Mata Umar. Umar has passed and he used to cry over this. And um, on one grave it was written very profound. Um, oh, the one standing in front of my grave. Don't be surprised at my state that I've died. Like, oh, he went too soon. What, what does he mean by he went too soon? He goes, when Allah has written, he went too soon. Just yesterday, as in just in the past, I was like you. I was standing on someone else's grave in front of someone else's grave. Or I was standing on top of the earth. And tomorrow, in the near future or whenever, you'll be like me. That's it. It's just a, a difference of six foot. Another poet, he says, When you take a body to the, to the graveyard, Know that it could be your turn next. It could be. So this is why you have to start preparing for death. I'll come back to preparation for death. It's very important. The third thing, we lose our attachment to the things of this world. We don't get attached to everything. We don't get deeply saddened by something or too happy by so with something. The fourth thing, we don't, it prevents us from amassing too much wealth. We have enough for today. We have enough for this week, for this year, for maybe I've got some kind of plan, building a home or something, but not too much. Not just constantly just gathering. That's why Allah says in the Quran, <laughs> that increasing in this world, this has made you forget the hereafter. Until you visit the graves, which has two meanings. One is until you pass away and you'll understand. Or number two, until you actually look at the graves and you see this person who was alive for 60 years has been dead for 100. So he must have had such high ambitions, hopes. He ended up living only 60 years. He's already underneath for 100. And then we think of people who have been under there for thousands of years. And it makes us, encourage us to repent. That we, we understand that I need to repent to Allah. I need to turn to Allah. I need to... Uh, ask Allah to forgive my sins now before it's too late. How many people they said tomorrow, 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 and then they never woke up the next day. You know, so many times they say, oh, tomorrow I'll do this. I'll wait next week. I'm not speaking to somebody in my family. I'll do it next week. I'll do it when I meet them. I'm not, I've not, I've got this debt. I've got this to repay. I'll do it. I'll do this soon. And then it never comes. So the scholars mentioned this four people regarding death, four types of people with regards to death. If death is going to come to everyone, but everyone has a different way of approaching it. The first person is engrossed in this world, meaning so attached to this world, only cares about this world. So they obviously fear death. Not only do they fear death, that's if they believe in the hereafter, but they don't even like the sound of it. They don't even like people talking about it. Why are you always talking about the hereafter? Why are you always telling me that we have to go? Let's just enjoy. Let's live in the moment. YOLO. Only live once. Let's just enjoy it now. Don't think about what's coming later. That's the first group, obviously. The worst. The second group of people are the lovers of Allah wa ta'ala who are always wishing for death. That when am I going to meet Allah? When am I going to meet Allah wa ta'ala? Ibrahim alayhi salam was like this. When Allah said, I want to meet you, he said that I'm ready to meet my Khalil and my close friend. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the angel of death came and asked permission. And he said, I'm waiting to meet Allah wa ta'ala. Like this, the close friends to Allah, they're waiting for Allah, they're waiting for the permission just to go meet Allah. The third group of people are the true and the highest level which is the ones who love Allah so much that they're not waiting to, to meet Allah. They're just happy with whatever Allah's judgment is. If Allah wants them to live longer, they live longer. Maybe to serve the people. That's why many scholars, when they were about to go, they, they wish for a longer life just to serve people. Just to maybe finish off a book they were writing or to continue serving people, were guiding them towards Allah. Because when you pass away, that can't happen. Like you, in Surah Yasin, Allah talks about the pious person who warned his people. They killed him when he 
who was stood up in front of Allah, he said, Ya layta qawmi ya'lamun. If only my people knew. So he still wanted to go back and guide them. So this, that's the, th the third group. And the fourth group, which is majority of us, or we hope so, is those people who are wanting to get close to Allah, but they only fear death because they're not sure whether the tawbah is complete, whether their repentance is uh, complete, whether they're going to meet Allah, Allah is happy with them. So they're nervous about this. And the example the people get, the scholars give is when you're meeting your beloved after many years, after a long time, and then suddenly you just get butterflies. Like, oh, maybe I've changed. Maybe he or she won't like how I'm dressed, how, my, how I look now. Or, you know, something, the gifts I've got. Will she be happy? Will he be happy, etc. So that kind of nervousness you get. So that's how one, that's how majority of us, we hope that's how we are. But obviously Allah Taala will pardon those people as well. So this is the kind of the four groups with regards to death. So how do we prepare for death? Very important. We'll finish with this inshallah. The first thing is, of course, we repent to Allah Taala from now. I'm, and I have to understand that tawbah is not something that should ever be delayed. I mentioned before as well that one of the tricks of shaitan is that he makes us delay our tawbah. And one of the worst tricks he does is, he says to us, just do the sin one more time and then stop. Just do the sin one more time and then stop. This will be last. Like you're committing a sin and then he says, okay, we'll give up. But just do it one, one last time. Go out with your friends one last time and do this or something. And the scholars give the example of this is, it's like you've got uh, impurity on your body and you're washing it away with urine. Because you're already in filth and you think doing one more act of filth is going to solve it. No, it'll never work like this. So we have to make sure that I repent now in front of Allah Taala. The second thing you do is start doing good deeds. Of course, start working your way towards good deeds and then hopefully Allah will make it easy for you. The third thing which is very, of utmost importance is that between us and the creation of Allah, the different, our fellow Muslims especially, especially family members, ask all the brothers and sisters to contribute to the masjid inshallah, may Allah reward you, is between our Muslim brothers and sisters and especially family members, we, we join our ties. If any ties have been broken, uh, if any rights we haven't fulfilled, we make sure we join these, we make sure we fulfill these, go ask for forgiveness, be the better person. Uh, make sure that we don't leave the world with anyone having a grudge with us, anyone pointing a finger at us, saying, no, no, this person took my right. And there's many incidents that have happened of brothers and sisters, and the sister, she said, I will never forgive him. Her brother, after he died, because he didn't let me take a share of the inheritance from our father when he passed away. And she had that grudge with him, and even on his janazah, she said, I'm not going to attend the janazah, I'm not going to forgive him. Then we don't know what's happening to that person. And many different incidents we have like this. So make sure we don't leave this world and people have grudges with us. So we, we, if we've stolen something, taken something by accident, we haven't returned it physically, then we obviously do it. If you've hurt someone, backbited, uh, broken someone's heart, we have to do this. The, third, the fourth thing we do is settle our debts. Debts is very important. This is something sometimes we take um, a little lightly. What I mean by this is sometimes a person has debts. And yet still they're traveling, still they're spending lavishly. If you have a debt, let's make a plan to pay it off to, to obviously our Muslim brothers, sisters, even to anyone. Yes, we still carry on. It doesn't mean we go hungry now until we pay it off. But, but we have to cut down our extravagance. Traveling for holidays and doing this, buying this and that, or ex investing in other things while we have debts. This is not the way of a Muslim. We live within our means and where we have to take a loan, we take it. But we make sure we have a plan to pay it off. At the beginning, the Prophet ﷺ was very strict. When a janazah would come, he would ask, does this person have any debts um, that they owe to other people, like the one that's passed away? And the companions, he'd wait for the reply. If the companion said yes, he would say, okay, I'm not going to. Have they put anything in place for it to be paid off? Meaning, have they told someone or whatever, and is it going to be paid off? And then again, if the companion said no, then he would say, okay, sallu alayhi, sallu ala sahibikum, pray upon him. I'm not even going to pray the janazah. Imagine the Prophet ﷺ alive in your time, and he's refusing to, Lead the janazah salah, not even lead, not even read the janazah, not even perform it behind someone else because of the debt that you have. So we have to make sure whatever debts we have, be it mortgage, and that's a whole different issue, but be it any debt we have with people, uh, that we make a plan. That I'm going to try pay it off slowly, surely, obviously it can't happen straight away, etc. But we make a plan. So we, we do this. Another thing we do is, so that's in terms of, another thing we do, we set up a direct debit with Allah. Meaning those things which are going to help us after we pass away. Whether it's building a masjid, building a well, helping orphans, um, investing in these kind of things. This will continue to give us reward after you pass away. And especially our children. Invest in your children. After you pass away, who's going to remember us? Who's going to make dua for us? Who's going to visit our graves? Who's going to read for us, etc. We don't know. 
but our children are the ones who will remember us. I, I remember when I was young and we used to, anytime we used to get in the car, our father would say to us that just recite Surah Ikhlas three times, which gives you the reward of the full Quran and just send the reward to his father who passed away. Now imagine his, his father, meaning my grandfather got so much reward just because of this. So the children that we have, especially them, let's ensure that they leave a legacy for us behind. Meaning our reward increases or whatever punishment we may be getting decreases because of the good deeds and the actions of our children. Very important or even students that we teach or whatever. So this is a direct debit we can set up with Allah. The Prophet ﷺ said all our actions end at the time of death except a few and he mentioned these. We're building a grave, uh, building, a, uh, building a well, building a masjid, uh, our children, our knowledge that we imparted upon people etc. And then in terms of physical things, this is very important, uh, that's sometimes we overlook again, that our burial expenses, our shroud, our grave allotment, these kind of things, if we prepare from now. Some people say it's a bit of a negative thought that why should I prepare my grave from now? It's as if I'm, I assume I'm going to die soon. But no, no, this will always keep a reminder in our head that I have some money aside. I say this is my burial fund. I'm never going to touch it. And my kids should know it. And this is going to be used when I die. Or even buy the shroud from now. This is very important. Companions used to do this in the time of the Prophet. They'd have a certain garment that they'd wear for jihad to fight in the path of Allah. And they'd say, I am also going to be buried in this. So they'd have that prepared. So this is something important physically that we should do. Set aside some money and say, from now, I'm going to keep adding to this every month or whatever. And when I pass away, this should be used so that I'm not a burden upon someone else. Like if you have no money, then obviously people have to give the money. That's one thing. And also I'm preparing myself uh, for when I die. The second thing is our inheritance and our wills. This is also such, such importance. Our inheritance has to be in line. First of all, I have to have the knowledge that may, when I pass away my will, my, my money, where is it going to go? My assets, where is it going to go? What I leave behind, who is going to get it? And Allah has given us strict instructions in the Quran. Allah starts by saying, you see Allah. Allah orders you. And in the end, Allah says, tilka hududullah. These are the laws of Allah. And وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَيَتَعَدَّ هُدُودِ يَدْخُلُنَا عَنْ خَالِرًا فِيهَا Whoever disobeys these will enter fire of hell. So imagine you lived your whole life right, but you didn't settle your inheritance properly. Allah is saying, these are Allah's laws. And if you disobeyed him at that time, that's why the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith, he mentions that sometimes uh, a believer, man or woman, worships Allah for 60 years. 60 years worshipping Allah Taala. And then enters the fire of Jahannam. Why? Because when they were passing away at the time of death, they wrote their will wrong. Meaning, uh, they gave money who they, they uh, deprived one of their inheritors. And because of that, Allah Taala put in the fire. How they took the right of someone when they were passing away. So it's very important our inheritance and our will. We write for now. In the hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that um, uh, there's no right upon a Muslim that he has some wealth and two days goes upon passes by upon that wealth but he hasn't written it in his will meaning anything that we have we should go into our will that i've got this now and this is my this is written down is my bequeath either it goes in my inheritance or it goes in my will very important that we do this um lastly what the prophet sallallahu said whoever deprives anyone of their inheritance allah will deprive him of the inheritance of jannatul firdaus like in the quran allah says that الفردوس, the muslims will inherit jannatul firdaus but the Prophet ﷺ in this hadith is saying that person who deprives someone at that time of inheritance, Allah will deprive him of the inheritance of the judgment. Very important that we learn these things because we may think that we're spending our entire life properly, but right at the end, when we're about to go, we mess up with the inheritance or the will, we'll have to pay for it all the way uh, until maybe our inheritors forgive us. Especially in the countries where ignorance is there, etc. Even we had a, a case in our community where a person came to him and he said his, his mother is the only sister and his old brothers and the uncles, so his uncles are depriving his mother of the inheritance. So now they're all going to be liable in the eyes of, in the court of Allah Taala. One of the great scholars in India, when people used to come, they wanted to rectify themselves. He'd say to them first, just tell me, did your mother get inheritance? Did your aunts get inheritance? And then he used to go a few generations up. He says, if not, go to a scholar, recalculate it all, because if your entire life has been coming off, unlawful means, then how can you come and rectify yourself? So this is very important. That's why inshallah we'll, we'll hold a few courses inshallah weekly where we can learn about inheritance and we can learn how to write a will. Then we'll all write our will as well inshallah. Uh, and then we keep adding to it and amending it as we go. Allah Taala gives ability to act on what has been said.